five weeks. So we might do a review session next, next Friday. Um, so keep that in mind uh, just as part of the housekeeping. So what I want to talk about today is I want to do two things. I want to drill down on some of the stuff Professor Sachs was talking about on Tuesday. I want to continue a little bit with where he left off because he didn't get a chance to finish his discussion on public goods and that sort of thing. So I'm going to do that. We finished Professor Sachs's lecture, and then I will talk. Uh, I will drill down on some of the theories of government, the two opposing theories of government, you know, libertarianism on one hand and John Rawls on the other hand. Uh, a lot of you have already uh, explored some of these traditions. I saw it in your essays, uh, uh, but nonetheless, I think that they warrant uh, a deeper discussion. Uh, given uh, contemporary relevance to uh, the issues related to the nature and role of government in society. So let me start by doing a screen share. Uh... Okay, so let's start off again. This is prof from Professor Sachs. We talked about the different types of goods and what are public goods. Um, if you look at the, uh, at the corner, at the bottom right corner, you'll see public goods. Public goods are, are goods that are non-rival and non-excludable. So what does excludability and rival mean? Well, excludable means you can prevent those who don't pay for it from using it. So you can prevent those who don't pay for it from using it. Rival means uh, the same good cannot be consumed by different people at the same time. So a private good is both rival and excludable. You can prevent those who don't pay for it from using it, and the same good can't be consumed by different people at the same time. And think about the examples that Professor Sachs gave, like, any goods or services like furniture, food, seats at a sports stadium. Um, you know, only one person can occupy a seat at a time. Therefore, it's, it's rival. And you can basically exclude people who don't pay for it from, uh, from using that seat. Therefore, it's excludable. So private goods are rival and excludable. And they're goods that can be provided on the market. The opposite of that, go down to the opposite quadrant, which is public goods, and they're goods that are both non-rival and non-excludable, um, and, uh, and hence they will not be provided by the market. Um, think of goods like uh, defense or public sanitation or science. Um, uh, if you just take national defense, um, it's non-excludable. You can't exclude people from it. You know, if you provide, the government provides national defense, everybody benefits. Um, you can't uh, exclude people. And it's, 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 it's non-rival because um, everybody's consuming it at the same time. So that's a classic example of a public good, uh, something that is non-excludable and non-rival. Now, there are two intermediate cases that are called... Um, common resources, and club goods. So common resources are non-excludable but rival, and club goods are excludable but non-rival. So it gets a bit complicated, so just let's keep it in our mind. Let's start with common resources, non-excludable and rival. So non-excludable means you can't prevent from those who don't pay for it from using it, but they're rival. So in other words, the same good cannot be consumed by different people at the same time. So think of common resources like air or water or forests. Um, these are typically environmental goods. Um, think of, and we have, um, you might have heard of something called the tragedy of the commons. Uh, this is a classic example of these kinds of goods that people tend to overconsume because... And um, you can't uh, exclude people um, 
So think of um, the tragedy of the commons. Think of uh, in medieval times, you had a uh, common pasture uh, where all villagers could um, graze their animals. Um, because it's common, because nobody owns it, then everybody can kind of graze their animals at the same time, uh, which means that you tend to overgraze because I don't want to use it less because I don't think you're going to use it less. It's a classic non-cooperative problem. And uh, in modern day, this is pretty much the way we describe environmental problems. Um, uh, think of climate change. Um, we all contribute to climate change. Um, we all um, suffer from climate change, but you can't, um, you can't prevent those who don't pay for it from using the climate, from using the air. Uh, and therefore, people will overconsume it. They will, they will spew way too much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, because when one person consumes a common resource, it reduces other people's enjoyment of it. That's why it's rival. Uh, so non-excludable, but rival. And these are environmental goods, common resource goods. The other corner is club goods. So these are non-rival and excludable. So they're excludable. You can keep people from consuming them if they don't pay for it, but they're non-rival. In other words, they can be consumed by different people at the same time. And think of things like computer software, cable TV, or Wi-Fi. You think of, a, of cable TV, for example, um, it's excludable because you pay for cable TV, and if you don't pay for it, you don't use it. It's as simple as that. So it's provided by the market. But it's also non-rival because once you provide it, there's really no limit to the amount of people who can use it at the same time, um, which makes it a difficult choice, a difficult uh, situation for markets, even though markets can't provide club goods, obviously. Um, another example would be maybe a fire protection service in a small town. Um, let's say you have a small town, you have a private fire protection society. Uh, it's excludable because uh, if you don't pay into the fire protection society, they'll say, well, we won't uh, put your fire out when the fire happens. But it's really not rival because the cost of protection protecting an additional house is very, very small. Because once you have the fire trucks and the engines and ready to go, it's very easy to you know, put a fire out. And there's a very, well, I, I wouldn't say funny because it's not funny, but uh, it's an enjoyable story from ancient Rome. Um, one of the richest men in ancient Rome is a guy called Crassus. And one way he made money was he would, um, he would hire a bunch of thugs to burn people's houses down and then he'd show up with his private um, fire prevention service and say, if you don't pay me money, I will uh, let your house burn down. So he would extort money from people um, who, the, who didn't want their house to burn down, which, of course, was started by his own thugs. So this is a classic example of what happens when you don't have a functioning government, right? When you get private bands of thugs um, who can control... Um, who can control, uh, who have a control coercion. Uh, uh, but that's just a funny example. He was providing a club good, but a very kind of mafia style club good. Um, Professor Sachs also gave the example of vaccines design as a, as, a, um, as a club good, because in a sense, if you think about it, innovative technologies like vaccine design can be non-rival, but excludable. So in principle, these technologies can be produced by any company once the design is out there in the public, uh, but it's usually excludable because drug companies have patents. Um, so there's rationing. So not everybody, so only a small number of companies can produce this. So it's, um, so it's, it's a non-rival, it's, it's excludable. 
Um, but there's inefficiency because the patent, the good, is underused. There's just too little of it produced because only one company has the patent. So that can be also seen as a kind of a, of a club good. The issue here is that markets will really only provide private goods effectively. Everything else, there is complications. Uh, think about the classic example of it's non-excludable. So if you have a public good or a common uh, pool resource good, um, then consumers, self-interested consumers won't pay for it because you can't exclude them. They will, another, they will free ride on it. They'll get the benefit without paying for it. So it's undersupplied in the market economy. On the other hand, common resource problems, tragedy of the commons, it tends to be over-consumed, over too much consumption, because nobody wants to cut back their consumption because they don't trust the other guy is going to do the same thing. So when you, especially when you have non-excludable goods, it's really hard for free markets to provide them efficiently, effectively, and equitably. This gets to the example. So we've talked, broken it down. We've talked about the tragedy of the commons and free riding. So you, you can free ride on public goods. You have a tragedy of the commons when it comes to common resources. Um, these are both examples of externalities. An externality is when you engage in activity that affects the well-being of another person, but you don't pay for it and you don't receive any compensation for it. It's a spillover effect on the well-being of another. And that can be both positive and negative. So, a co so example, a negative externality will be pollution, right? You're imposing a pollution. If you're a company that's polluting, you're, imposed, you're imposing a cost on society, but you're not held responsible for that. You're not paying for that cost. Um, therefore, you overproduce pollution. Um, a benefit would be a positive externality. For example, think about education or basic research. A, a more educated citizenry uh, creates all kinds of positive benefits for society. Um, but a market would underprovide that because it doesn't get paid for, a private company doesn't get paid for the positive benefits it would uh, give to society. So a negative externality, market produces too much. Positive externality, market produces too little. And as, as I said, the free rider problem is an externality. If you provide a public good, everybody benefits, but not everybody pays, so it's underprovided. Tragedy of the commons is an externality. Uh, this time it's a negative externality and it's overconsumed. So how do we deal with this? How do we, how do we respond to these uh, different issues? Well, it's easy with um, private goods because they're both excludable and rival, so the market will deal with them. They're, mark, they're market transactions. Um, and for public goods, we generally say, if they're, they're non-rival and non-excludable, we generally say it's best that they're provided by government, government um, um, provision. So on the two quadrants, the top left and the bottom right, we have the market and we have government. The other two, the opposing quadrants, are more complicated cases. And here we have a, a, more, a, a more complicated mix of both markets and governments working together. So how do we deal with common resources? Well, the standard way is environmental regulation. You regulate the resource. You make sure you basically have a regulation as to how, many, of how you use uh, a common resource. And um, for example, you would regulate pollution, you would regulate um, carbon dioxide uh, omission, emissions. Um, by the way, you can also tax, you can also impose a tax as well as regulation. You can tax emissions, you can tax pollutions, or you can create tradable licenses like, um, like cap and trade, 
which we will discuss later when we talk about climate change. So in other words, you set a, a limit to the amount of pollution. And once the limit is set, it's capped, you allow companies to trade um, uh, the right to pollute within that limit with each other. Um, an economist will tell you that that's quite similar to taxing uh, the pollution uh, because it, both, it, it basically reduces the amount of pollution. So you can regulate or you can tax or you can create tradable licenses there's also one more solution. You can basically, you can make it excludable by assigning property rights. And this is what happened in England with the enclosure movement. When we talked about the, remember we talked about the, the common pastures, what tended to happen was governments basically started giving big landowners the right to use this land exclusively and kicked the small farmers off the land. They no longer had the right to use it. Well, that solved the common pool problem, because now it's owned by the landowner, but it created another problem. It creates a problem of, un, of great injustice. Um, so you can see that, um, you know, there's a lot of different uh, social justice theories coming out in this. And of course, when you get to club goods that are uh, excludable and non-rival, the patent rights would be for uh, a good, like an innovative technology, like vaccine technology. Uh, obviously, other goods like uh, Wi-Fi or computer software can be provided by the market, but um, can run into problems of monopolies, uh, which we're going to talk about right now. So that's public goods and the whole, you know, architecture, infrastructure around how you look at public goods. Another argument for a government intervention in economic transactions is natural monopolies. Now, what is a natural monopoly? A natural monopoly is when you have market power because of economies of scale. There are barriers to entry. What does that mean? It means that a single firm can supply a good or a service at a lower cost than two or more firms. So, why is that? Because there are economies of scale over a range of output. So that in technical terms, if you remember your microeconomics, so there are very large fixed costs. There's a high fixed cost, but there's a low marginal cost. Think of the provision of electricity as a very simple but clear example. So there are big fixed costs. There are big startup costs. Because if you want to set up an electricity grid, you have to lay down the wires and build the infrastructure, and that costs a lot. But once you've got that in place, the marginal cost is very low. If you build a new house or a new apartment and you want to hook that up to the electricity grid, the cost is almost zero because the, the wires are, all, are already there. So very high fixed cost, but very low marginal cost. So technically, the average total cost per unit of output decreases as output increases. That's what we mean by economies of scale. That's what we mean in this case of natural monopoly. So in the electricity example, as more houses are added, the costs get lower of adding each house to the grid, which makes it efficient for a single firm to serve the market. Um, so classic examples will be a highway system, uh, water and sewerage systems, like I said, the power of the electricity grid, uh, or vaccine production We're back to, uh, will be another example. And so how do we deal with it? Well, there are two ways to deal with it. Either, pub either you provide it publicly, which we do for roads, uh, or you provide it privately, but you, reg you regulate it heavily, like power generation. And the reason why you would regulate it heavily is because you, want, you don't want that monopolist to exploit the market power and, and maximize its profits by charging prices that are really, really high. Because basically, if you're the only firm and the consumer has no choice, you have to pretty much pay what the power company or whatever other company is asking. So that's why we have regulation. 
to make sure you can't exploit that market power. Um, so again, just like with public goods, you have this kind of nexus of either public provision alone or a, a mix of public provision and private, private provision, but with public regulation. So in all cases, there is a clear role for government. Notice that everything I've talked about so far is coming out of standard economics. Um, this is where standard neoclassical economics would see a role for government. Two classic examples would be, as I mentioned, public goods or natural monopolies. Okay, that's that subject. That finishes what I wanted to talk about Professor Sachs's lecture. The next topic I want to talk about is the welfare state. Just very quickly, this is a different situation. This is not public goods. This is the provision of uh, government transfers, uh, like, uh, or, or, well, it can be, or government spending or transfers. So it can be health care, education, or it can be transfers to reduce poverty. It can be transfers for children, or it can be just income transfers, uh, as Biden is proposing in his, in his plan. But the goals of the welfare state are to alleviate poverty, to reduce inequality, and to insure against risk. What do I mean insure against risk? Well, you risk of losing a job. Therefore, you have unemployment insurance. If you are unemployed for a temporary period of time and you lose your income, the government will step in to provide you temporary unemployment income until you get another job. Likewise, if you're on insurance against illness, if you're sick and you have a very high medical bill, uh, you generally have insurance um, uh, uh, to be able to pay for those medical bills. And uh, let me give you the example of, of health insurance, because this is a, a, an example, again, as, as to how you can have a complicated mix of public and pro private provision. Um, there's two ways to provide health insurance. One is, as a lot of countries around the world do, including in the UK and in Canada and in parts of Europe, is called um, single payer. You've heard about this. Medicare is an example of single payer. And this is where the government acts as the insurer. Everybody pays in a little premium. The government pools those resources. And then when you're sick, the insurance program, Medicare or whatever it is, will pay your medical costs. So the insurance is done pretty much by the government. And one example of that is it's efficient because you're pooling the risk over a very large number of people. You have young people, oh, well, Medicare is only old people, but if you have this, a society-wide version of it, you will have a lot of young people who, don't, who, who are cheap to insure because they don't get sick as much, but also old people who probably need to be uh, take more taken care of and, uh, and the funding is there for them. You can also, though, do it through private insurance. But this gets complicated. Think about it. If you have a purely private insurance, health insurance scheme, the insurance company obviously wants to make money. And the way it can make money is try to make sure that the people you insure are young and healthy. In other words, they don't drain your resources. Um, so a pre market system is not going to work because the insurance company will basically say, I'm sorry, you're 75 years old, you're too risky, you're going to cost too much to insure, I'm turning you down. Or I'm going to charge you an outrageous premium to be insured uh, that you can't afford. So the government will come in and say, Well, we're going to stop you doing that. We're going to make sure, we're going to tell you, you're going to regulate private insurance so that you can't discriminate based on age or health status. So it says you have to insure everybody. You can't turn down 75 year olds. You can't turn down somebody because they have a pre-existing condition um, and hence they might 
need more health care in the future. You have to insure everybody. And you have to charge people fair premia. So the problem there is the overall cost of insurance is going to rise. And then what happens is the young and healthy will say, well, this is not a good deal for me. Um, if I stay in this insurance scheme, I'm paying a lot every month in premiums, but I'm not really using insurance because I'm young and I'm healthy. Don't really need it. So I'm going to drop my insurance. This is a real problem because if that happens, you get left with a pool of, insu a pool of insurance that's basically older and sicker and more costly. And that's called the insurance debt spiral. Um, so again, the government has to step in for a second time and they say, well, we're going to infor you're going to have to buy insurance. Whether you, sorry, whether you like it or not, we're going to force you to buy insurance. And that's called an individual mandate. And if this, uh, and there's one more step. So we have regulate what you can discriminate based on and what you can't, regulate an individual mandate, but it still might be too expensive for some people to buy this insurance. So the government will say, well, let's have subsidies in place for people who are too poor to pay out of pocket uh, for this insurance. And that is your alternative to single payer. Now, what I've described, some of you who are paying attention will notice, what I have described is exactly the system of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare this three-legged pillar of uh, regulating that insurance companies can't discriminate based on age or pre-existing conditions, uh, regulating an individual mandate and giving subsidies for people who are too poor to, um, to pay for it themselves. So that's, if you want to do it through private insurance, that's how you would do it. Otherwise, it's not going to work which is why when you heard a lot of politicians saying we want to find an alternative to Obamacare, they couldn't come up with one because you've seen the various traps you fall into if you take one of these legs of the stool away, if you want to keep insurance affordable for everyone. Of course, if you don't care how much you're paying, if the government just wants to subsidize whatever the insurance company charges, then that's a different story. But, uh, but that's not the situation we live in. Um, another debate with the welfare state is the debate between universal and means-tested benefits. So a universal benefit is a benefit you get to everybody, um, like universal social insurance. But a means-tested is what it says. It says you only get this benefit if your income is below a certain level, or you're poor. And so obviously you see a lot of arguments that say, well, which is better? Well, you, you see a basic fairness argument. Why should we give uh, handouts to people making a million dollars a year? Why should we give a benefit to them? They're rich, they don't need it. We should be targeting the poor. That's a basic fairness argument. Uh, but on the other side, what are the arguments against uh, means-tested uh, 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 benefits? And I think there are three. One is a poverty trap. And this is to say that if you means-test something, there is a, a limit at which you no longer get the benefit. So let's say you get a job and you earn $1 more in income. That could mean you lose $1 in whatever government benefit you're getting. So you don't take the job. It's not worth it. That's a poverty trap. You're stuck in this because the, the incentives are so the incentives are set up that way. And this was often the old welfare system in the US before the before Clinton changed it in 96. There were a lot of problems like this, that you know, you could lose your benefits if you got a job. So there's a lot of, so there was no incentive to take a job. Um, the second, I would say, argument against means testing is stigma. Um, if you think that, you know, the whole, um, 
if people look at mean at at a benefit as just something for the poor, they will say, well, this is the the old Ayn Rand argument. This is just the takers taking from the makers. These are the welfare queens. They don't deserve it. So you might feel that your dignity is being demeaned when you take this benefit. There's a stigma attached to it. And in an, almost in an Aristotelian sense, um, you lose your sense of dignity and meaning and purpose that comes from living a flourishing life because you're seen as taking a handout. And I think the third argument against means testing would be um, the way welfare, the way universal welfare systems work is like everybody pays in and everybody gets out. So for example, you have a universal child benefit. So everybody with children gets the benefit. Everybody pays their taxes. They know that part of that tax revenue has been used to provide this benefit and you get a lot of political support for it. So, but if it's means tested, what happens often is the middle class who don't benefit from this, they withdraw political support from the welfare state because they're not benefiting from it. Um, this is, and you know, the whole, the model in places like Scandinavia is very much based on universal models. Everybody gets universal healthcare, education, parental leave, child benefits, all these kinds of benefits, but taxes are high because everybody's paying in, but there's a lot of political support because everybody knows everybody is benefiting. There's no stigma attached to it. So these are the issues, the debate between universal and means-tested benefits. A very relevant debate for the welfare state still today. And you probably, some of you explored some of these issues in your essays, because when you talk about the universal basic income, it's by definition universal, it's not means-tested. So one argument against it, which some of you raised was, well, why should the rich get it? So should we have a cutoff limit? So if you look at Biden's plan for $1,400 checks, uh, one of the um, uh, points of opposition to it is, well, why should this go to the rich? And that's a valid point. Why do the rich need it? Uh, on the other hand, if it just goes to the poor, you get problems of stigma and, uh, and poverty. You don't, well, with, with universal basic income, you don't get poverty traps because you get it whether you work or not. The benefit is not withdrawn. Uh, when you get a job. And that's why it's a lot of economists prefer something like that to, um, uh, to uh, means-tested benefits that are tied, that you lose when you get a job. You don't lose it when you get a job with the UBI, uh, which is one argument for it. But we'll, we'll talk more about the UBI when we talk about inequality in a few weeks' time. But you guys know more about that subject than I do now, so I'll, 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 uh, I'll, uh, I'll stop. So that's basically a few minutes on the welfare state. I put it in there because it's it's a it's a role of government. It's an important role of government, and it's a uh, and it's I think it's becoming more important again. People are becoming more aware that uh, reducing poverty and ensuring against risk is uh, is a strong role for government. This goes back to uh, the New Deal in the U.S. Uh, the war on uh, by Franklin Roosevelt, the new the, the war on poverty by Lyndon Johnson. And then kind of you had um, uh, from Reagan through Clinton in the sense you had a view that the government should reduce the size of the welfare state because it created all kinds of bad incentives. And I think now there's, an, there's a, a feeling that that went too far and that you do need a strong welfare state, but you need it to be well-designed uh, as well as, 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 as generous. Okay, let's go back to the, the political philosophies, and we're going to switch gears now. We're going to talk about libertarianism. Uh, and we're going to do libertarianism, and then we do John Rawls, and then we wrap it up for the day, for the day because they're a kind of, they wrote, the, Nozick, Robert Nozick and John Rawls wrote books more or less at the same time in the early 70s, basically opposing each other. Um, Rawls said justice is fairness. Nozick says justice is liberty. So it's predicated on the idea of self-ownership. You own yourself and you own your labor. Therefore, you're entitled to the fruits of your labor. 
if this sounds like John Locke, then it should, because this is where this is coming from. So if you own yourself, you own the fruits of your labor. Hence, any government interference is theft and coercion. So that would, for some extreme libertarians, that includes taxes. Um, this is a negative freedom. It's the freedom from coercion. It's not the positive freedom to flourish and develop your capacities in an Aristotelian sense. Um, so two issues, two quotes, one from Nozick and one from Hayek. Um, Nozick said, like, let me, let me, yeah. Nozick said, there's no social entity uh, with a good that undergoes some sacrifice for its own good. There are only individual people, different individual people with their own individual lives. Using one of these people for the benefit of others uses him and benefits the others, nothing more. So in other words, you're violating the liberty of a person if you try and enforce some notion of a common good. That quote from Nozick is basically saying there's no such thing as the common good. There's no such thing as society. There are only individual people with individual freedoms. And if you try and enforce a common good, you're just using that person. So that's point number one. Um, libertarianism is about liberty and freedom. Point number two is there's no objective theory of a good as there is in the, in, with Aristotle. Um, Hayek has a great quote here. Freedom granted only when it is known beforehand that its effects will be beneficial is not freedom. In other words, you should have the freedom to do what you want as long as you don't bump into somebody else and as long as it doesn't go against the law. Um, so, but uh, there's, no, there's, there's no objective idea of the good. There's no sense that as an Aristotle that you become in touch with your human nature and you will uh, instinctively choose the good because it's aligned with your human nature to live a life of reason and virtue. Um, that's not there in libertarianism. Um, you basically, you define your own idea of the good and you choose it because that's freedom. You free, you're free to choose your own idea of the good. That's a quintessential part of, um, of, of libertarianism. Now, oops. Um, Nozick basically said that he believed that only in a minimal state that enforces contracts and protects against force. So, he, so even Nozick realizes, even libertarians realize there has to be some state. And why does there have to be some state? Well, go back to the example of Crassus in ancient Rome, the guy who sent his thugs burning down houses. If you didn't have a government to basically protect against mafias and force, you will have chaos. So there has to be a minimal state and Nozick thought that minimal state was a monopoly on violence and to enforce contracts. So he thought that the only natural monopoly in a sense, and we talked about natural monopoly earlier, but for Nozick, the only natural monopoly is coercive force. Uh, anything beyond that violates rights uh, not to be forced to do certain things. Okay. Professor Sachs mentioned the Will Chamberlain example. I don't know if I spelled Chamberlain right, but uh, I didn't actually, but that's fine. Um, the basketball player. And just to summarize it, um, this is the example of Nozick saying liberty upsets patterns. He said, let's, let's imagine you have a pattern and, let, and that pattern can be pure equality. Let's assume that, you do, that everybody's equal in society. And then you have Will Chamberlain paying his basketball and you have a little a bucket at the entrance of the basketball where people can throw in a dollar if they want to see Will Chamberlain play basketball. And pretty much because he's a really good basketball player and everybody loves to see him play, he get a lot of dollars and he become very rich. And so liberty is upsetting patterns. So even if you start from inequality, if you allow freedom and liberty, you're gonna get inequality because your people will voluntarily give their money to the likes of Will Chamberlain. Liberty upsets patterns. So any initial position you choose will be upset 
by the free market. So the starting point doesn't really matter. And if you intervene in that, you are undoing people's choices and you're violating the rights of Will Chamberlain, right? Taxing what he earned fairly. So in other words, liberty upsets patterns. And the only way you can stop liberty upsetting patterns is through coercion. Now, that's a powerful example, but I think there are problems with that. And, and I've listed on the, on the PowerPoint, I've listed five problems with this Will Chamberlain example. Maybe you can think of more problems with this, because I think that when you, if you think about this for a few minutes, you realize that this is not exactly right, because the economy is not a bunch of basketball players that people like and you willingly pay a dollar to see them. That's not the way it works. Uh, it's a complicated uh, interchange of buyers and sellers, people with a lot of power, people with less power. So first of all, our exchange is voluntary. Nozick is basically saying everything is voluntary, um, but there could be an unequal bargaining power. Let's assume that, take an example of uh, a low wage. Let's assume that um, somebody, the only job they can get is at McDonald's, which pays terrible wages. Um, they don't have the power to form a union. They don't have the power to get any higher wages than that. So is that, a, is that a voluntary exchange? It's voluntary in the sense that nobody's forcing you to work at McDonald's. But on the other hand, you don't have a choice. Uh, it's the only employment available to you. Um, so unequal bargaining power will benefit the rich. Uh, the second argument is that voluntary exchange don't leave everybody unharmed. Some people could starve. Some people could be left out. So there, like if you believe in a common good, then you, know, you have to include everybody. But voluntary exchanges ne don't necessarily include everybody in their benefits. They don't leave everybody unharmed. Uh, the idea that third, the idea that voluntary exchange doesn't necessarily upset patterns, is that right? Well, not necessarily, because if everybody, think about if you have a situation where everybody gets the kind of universal benefits we talked about earlier, so healthcare, education, vacation time, then you can still trade in the free market without upsetting the, basic, the pattern of basic needs for all. Everybody has basic needs, but you can trade and you're not upsetting that pattern. Everybody still has their basic needs. Um, and it's not coercion. Okay, fourth point, what duty does Will Chamberlain have to the poor and to society? We talked about his rights to keep what he earns, but remember when we did Catholic social teaching, you don't just have rights, you have duties attached to the right. Does Will Chamberlain have a duty to help the poor and to help society? In other words, doesn't he have a duty to pay taxes? because he belongs to society, he's benefited from society, and even if he's a great basketball player who deserves to earn a high income, fine, but he also deserves to give back because everybody has benefited from society somehow. What duties does he have to the poor and to society? Um, the fifth problem is, this is basically assuming, uh, if you wanna translate it into the language of neoclassical economics, that people are being paid their marginal product. They're being paid in line with their productivity to society. So Will Chamberlain is adding a lot of value to society because people really like to see him play basketball. So he gets paid a lot. But let's say somebody has low marginal product. They don't have many skills. They only have high school. They didn't go to college. Um, why should they have to suffer? Why should they suffer poverty uh, simply because they are, they are where they are uh, in, the, in the pecking order? Um, that's an, also an issue of justice that I think. So I think all of these examples, and they're kind of a lot, these examples kind of overlap, but they get to the broader question that libertarianism 
while it can be attractive because it's a very simple uh, and compelling doctrine, it also leaves open a whole bunch of questions uh, that don't fully get answers in libertarianism. There are objections to the kind of uh, approach, let me look at the time, the kind of approach that you get from Nozick. Uh, Catholic social teaching also has a lot of, uh, by the way, Catholic social teaching, I'll just mention it very quickly. It refers to a concept called the twin rocks of shipwreck. That would be one hand libertarianism, as we talked about. And on the other hand, kind of Soviet collectivism, which would be where the state owns everything, the means of production. So Catholic social teaching says both of these are wrong. Um, why? Remember, remember Thomas Aquinas talked about you, you allow private ownership, but private ownership must also be always be twinned with common use. In other words, the needs of all must be met. Private property is conditional. Well, collectivism suppresses private ownership in favor of, co of only common use. But libertarianism does the opposite. It suppresses all common use in favor of only private ownership. So Catholic social teaching occupies that middle space, that between the two twin, I love that term, the twin rocks of shipwreck. I use it all the time. I think it's great. Um, also collectivism elevates duties and neglects rights while libertarianism upholds only rights and neglects duties. We saw that with the Will Chamberlain example. And then I would also say that collectivism expresses only distributive justice, while libertarianism expresses only commutative justice. Remember, we did the different theories of justice when I did the lecture on Catholic social teaching. So Catholic social teaching for these reasons occupies a middle ground, a middle way between collectivism, Soviet style collectivism and libertarianism, Nozick and Hayek style libertarianism. And often that middle way can be seen as a kind of social democracy and a mixed economy. Um, some of the examples we saw earlier when we talked about the different types of goods, public goods, private goods, common resources, um, natural monopolies, uh, uh, welfare state, all of that, you get a mix of so uh, it's a, you get a mix of uh, the private sector and the public sector working together to kind of uh, align towards the common good. Okay. I've, I've put here 10 flaws of libertarianism, uh, which we can just do very quickly. Um, it's a purely negative view of freedom. You mentioned that already. Uh, there's, there's no positive view of freedom in the Aristotelian sense to flourish and, and develop, develop your virtues. It's divorced from the good. You define your own good. There's no objective good in accord with human nature, as uh, Aristotle would say. You often see the argument that compulsion undermines charity. But is that really true? Because remember, Aquinas said that one purpose of law is to habituate virtue, to make you more, law is designed to make you more virtuous. So libertarians would argue that if you compel people to give money, they, give, they become less generous. But that's not really, but you can argue against that. Another argument for libertarian, libertarians make is justice is only commutative. Whereas we know there's also distributive justice what society owes the individual and contributive justice, what the individual owns, owes society. Um, libertarianism denies the existence of society. We saw that with the Nozick quote. Um, it's a radical individualism. Uh, goes back, Margaret Thatcher once said, there's no such thing as society. There's only individuals and families. That's a classic statement of libertarianism. Virtue, to the extent that it's recognized by libertarians, is only individual. There's no social virtue. There's no idea of justice or solidarity that, that, that gives uh, rights and that, give, that, that emphasizes duties 
uh, your duties towards the well-being of the other. Property is an absolute right. We saw that. We know from the other theories of justice, other theories of social justice, that it's conditional. The market is morally neutral. We know from the civil economy paradigm, which we talked about last week, that the market is actually uh, not just, it's not neutral, but it's actually social. It's where you develop your relational nature uh, with other human beings and flourish. Um, libertarianism all, always creates a choice between free markets and collectivism. You know, they hear choice, oh, you're a socialist. Um, that's actually ignores the idea of the twin rocks of shipwreck and the, the kind of the balance in between. And finally, libertarianism following Milton Friedman would argue that the only goal of business is to maximize profits. Um, you're all in the Gabelli School of Business, so you all have seen this theory and you all know um, the weakness of that. So that's, my, that, that's just me trying to come up with some flaws of uh, libertarianism. Okay. Let's now switch from libertarianism to John Rawls. So John Rawls, as we discussed, as we know from Professor Sachs and from the readings that some of you have done. And here I'm, I'm going to follow Michael Sandel's chapter. Uh, oh, by the way, just a quick housekeeping aside. Uh, there's not many readings uh, for this week in the Blackboard because a lot of the readings you have already from earlier weeks. If you look at the thinkers that Professor Sachs talked about, we're looking at their, at, at their, 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 their perspectives on the role of government, but it, they're the same thinkers and the readings are the same. So if you've done the readings, you've done the readings. If you haven't, you can find them in earlier weeks. And I would recommend Michael Sandel's chapter on John Rawls because uh, it's simply, it's, it's very easy to understand and it's very well written and it's simple, but it also gets to the essence of what Rawls was really all about. So John Rawls talked about the original position behind the veil of ignorance. Uh, he asked the question, what would a rational, self-interested person do in these circumstances? That you don't know where you're going to end up in society. You don't know whether you're going to be a man or a woman, rich or poor, disabled or not disabled, um, an atheist or a religious believer. You don't know anything about a, a, a member of a majority or a minority, what race you'll be, how tall you'll be, how short you'll be. You don't know anything about what you're going to be in society. So what rules would you design in advance uh, for a just society if you didn't know where you were going to end up? And I think Rawls des designed, and these three are the ones that Rawls designed. He said, well, first of all, he said, you're not going to choose utilitarianism because you might end up as a minority, right? You might end up excluded from the, the utility function. And you won't choose libertarianism because you might end up poor at the bottom of the pile and nobody will be there to take care of you. So what will you choose? Well, you, first thing you choose is basic liberties for all. So each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive total system of liberties compatible with a similar system of liberty for all. Basic civil liberties. Um, why would you choose that? Uh, well, because you don't know where you're going to end up. Think of, um, let's, just say, let's just say you are going to be a believer in religious fundamentalism. Um, or you could be an atheist. Um, which system best accommodates both of those people? Well, a fundament, if you have a, a system of liberty, the religious fundamentalist can still practice his or her religion in that system. But if you have a fundamentalist, or if, you have a, if you don't have liberty for all, then the atheist suffers, is disadvantaged. So you choose liberty because more people are advantaged that way. 
The second one is inequalities must be attached to offices and positions of fair equality of opportunity. That means exactly what it says. You want equality of opportunity. You don't want people to have an unfair advantage uh, when they get ahead. And again, so liberty is one, opportunity is two. Um, but also, and the third one is basically the key, what's often called the difference principle. The, you choose only the social and economic inequalities that benefit the least advantaged person. Um, well, that's called, that's so, that's the essence of Rawls. That's what he argues you would take. Um, it's resources. He's talking more about resources than utility. Um, so these are often called primary goods. Primary goods are goods that you want more of rather than less of, and they're liberty, opportunities, and income and wealth. Um, now, and these are to be distributed equally unless unequal distribution is to everyone's advantage. You want to make sure you benefit the least advantage. Now, some people say that that's called a, a thin theory of the good. So it's funny because we often think of John Rawls as the polar opposite of Robert Nozick and the libertarians. Because for Nozick, justice is liberty. It's freedom from coercion. For John Rawls, justice is fairness. It's making sure that you only allow inequalities to the extent that you're benefiting the least advantaged. If you're not benefiting the least advantaged, you got to have a distribution that benefits them. So we often think that that's, they are the polar opposites. And in a sense, they are. But there's one area that they have in common. And that's the idea that they're both opposed to the Aristotelian idea that there is an objective notion of the good in accordance with human nature. Just like Nozick, Rawls thought you basically choose your own idea of the good. Rawls was famous for arguing that in any pluralistic society, it's really hard to come to a common agreement on what a common good would look like. Uh, he would say, look at the divisions in society. Look at Congress right now and how divided it is over pretty much everything. How can you possibly uh, agree on a common good in accordance with human nature when you have so much uh, division? So he basically had a very, what's called a thin theory of the good. He said, we can all agree on only very limited things. And those limited things are primary goods that we want more of rather than less of. We can all agree that we want liberties. We can all agree that we want opportunities. And we can all agree that we want uh, income and wealth. Um, and these three things should be distributed equally uh, and only unequally if it benefits the least advantage. So unlike Aristotle did, Aristotle thought that appealing to human nature would reduce these differences, and we could agree on a common good. Rawls was more pessimistic about that. Now, you might argue, let's, let's go a little further into... Um, Rawls looked at his four categories. Um, his first category is basically feudalism or the caste system, where your position in society depends on an accident of birth. You're born into a higher caste, you're born into an aristocracy, and your whole life and your life choices will depend solely, or not solely, but you, uh, strongly on how you were born. So obviously for Rawls, that's an unjust system. The next one will be libertarianism is a free market with formal equality of opportunity. So the position depends. So everybody is free in the free market to do as they want with their skills and their talents. The problem is the position depends on your economic advantage. Formal economic equality of opportunity does not rule out things like you, have a, you, you come from a richer family and your richer family can afford better schools. It can afford tutors. 
it can afford social enrichment activities like music lessons and art. It can afford, um, it can uh, tap into networks that help you find jobs. It can find internships. It can find all sorts of connections. So even if you have formal equality of opportunity, people start the race from different starting points. And for roles, that's unfair. The next step in the chain is the meritocratic system. That's the free market with fair equality of opportunity. You try and equalize these starting points so everybody starts from the same point. Now, I would argue that that's impossible because how do you make, how do you get to a position whereby people, but the children of the rich um, are not more advantaged than the children of the poor, given the, 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 the setup of things. How do you equalize that? I, I honestly don't know how you do that. But Rawls is actually making a deeper point than that. Rawls is saying, even if you manage to equalize the starting points, there is still an unfairness. And the unfairness comes because the position still depends on your natural talents and abilities and how society values these talents and abilities. Let's just say you're Will Chamberlain and you're playing basketball, right? You equalize the starting point. Let's assume that Will Chamberlain got no help from his parents. He didn't come from a rich background. He did it all himself and he solely uh, makes a lot of money because he can play basketball. Rawls argued that that's arbitrary because it just so happens that society values people who are good at playing basketball. Why should that be the case? It's arbitrary. That's what Rawls would argue that it's, that it's kind of arbitrary. Um, all, in a sense, all difference between people are morally arbitrary. It's just luck. It's just luck that our society really values sports like basketball. And if you have good skill there, you can make a lot of money. In Renaissance Italy, if you were a very talented painter of frescoes, you could make a lot of money and get a lot of social esteem because that society valued fresco painters. But our society today doesn't really value fresco, fresco painters so much. If you're a painter of frescoes, you know, you probably won't make much money and you won't be as esteemed as you would be in Florence in the 15th century. Um, so Rawls is basically arguing that distribution is the outcome of a natural lottery. That, yes, it's a result of effort, but he would argue that, like, bad basketball players put an effort too. Bad fresco painters put an effort too. Uh, another skill that our society values is, compu say, computer coding, coding skills, Right? Bad coders, people who are no good at computer coding, people like me who, do have, who have no clue about technology, you can put in a lot of effort too. So this brings Rawls. Rawls basically said that, and I think possibly the most radical thing Rawls said is that both nature and nurture are both morally arbitrary. The fact that you were born with advantages, whether you get those advantages from society, from your parents, from your social connections, or whether you get those advantages from your skills that you're born with. You're a great painter. You're a great basketball player. You're a great coder. Morally arbitrary, according to Rawls. This brings him to, this brings him to why he chooses egalitarianism and the difference principle. So, Yes, he would say, develop your talents, play that basketball game, but remember that the rewards of your that, that those talents reap in the market, in some sense, are attached to the community as a whole, and there's some sort of common asset, and you want to make sure that those benefits work for the good of the least fortunate. And that is where Rawls' difference, that is why Rawls believes in a veil of ignorance in the original position 
you would choose this difference principle that you would only allow inequalities to the extent that they benefit the least fortunate. And that's basically, in a nutshell, uh, John, John Rawls. Uh, I think he's a very powerful thinker. He's an extremely influential thinker. Um, uh, I, I remember once I watched an episode of The West Wing, and I don't know if any of you remember The West Wing, but it's probably a bit before your time. But if you haven't watched it and you're looking for a pandemic show to binge on because you've watched pretty much everything else and there's nothing new coming out, watch The West Wing. It's extremely well written by Aaron Sorkin. And there was one discussion about taxes and they were having this discussion. Well, why should you pay taxes? I, I earn my money. Why should I pay taxes? And one of the character goes, John Rawls, the difference principle. And I was like, this is great. This is like seeing the trolley problem on the good place. I love uh, seeing uh, theories of moral philosophy on TV shows. Maybe I'm just a geek. Maybe it's just me. Okay. Let me finish our discussion of government this, this morning by just listing some of the pathologies of the state. We have talked a lot about why the state is good, why the state performs valuable social functions, but the state can also be dysfunctional uh, in a host of different ways. And I don't need to ex go th explain too many of these in detail because you know them already. You could have oligarchy. This is where the state basically looks after the interest of the rich and the elites and doesn't care about anybody else. It's run by a small band of rich people. Aristotle warned against oligarchy, and Plato and Aristotle both warned against this. We saw that from Professor Sachs. You can have a situation of corruption where the government and government officials are trying to line their own pockets rather than support the common good. You can have industry capture where it's a form of corruption whereby um, the government is captured by a powerful industry in the country, maybe a, the oil and gas industry uh, uh, in some countries, uh, in countries, maybe the financial sector in countries that are tax havens, uh, industry capture. Insolvency is when a country borrows beyond its means and can pay back its debts and leads to financial crises. Um, some people argue that like Argentina today is an insolvent country, uh, but that's another pathology of the state. The suppression of civil liberties, obviously the example as to why that's a pathology of the state. Everybody from Nozick to Rawls agrees that liberty should be, you know, a, a key function of, of government. States can start wars. They can destabilize other countries. Don't need to go further than that imperialism, late 19th century, when European powers basically decided they would carve up the world between them through colonialism and imperialism. Um, uh, Lenin said that imperialism was the highest stage of capitalism. I'm not sure I would agree with that, but it, certainly in, this, in the late 19th century, it was certainly a case to be made for it. Um, communism, where the state owns all of the means of production and suppresses individual freedom and individual dignity and suppresses all rights to private ownership. Fascism, whereby the state attaches itself to a virulent nationalist ideology um, and again suppresses all um, freedom of expression and, um, and civil liberties. Um, you can have apartheid and racial exclusion we saw this, the, South, the South African state before 1991 or the US South uh, before the 1960s or to some extent in some places, maybe even still today, racial exclusion. And then finally, you can have fragile states. I, I listed that as a pathology because if a state is not strong enough to do even the basic things like provide a monopoly on violence or provide basic uh, security uh, or provide basic services, you can create, lead to all kinds of problems like 
think of a fragile state like uh, like um, like Somalia, uh, where you basically lost, where the government basically um, uh, lost uh, power and, uh, and got overtaken by uh, a bunch of uh, warlords and, and things like that. So these are this is my list of the pathologies of the state. Um, you might uh, come up with other ones. Uh, and I think we are at the end. Let me, why can't I, why can't I uh, do this? I need the shop stop staring the screen. Yep. How do I, why is my zoom small? Okay. All right. Okay. The zoom is messed up, but, uh, all right, whatever. Um, do we have, that's the end of class for today, folks. So uh, we will 